it's shiny, it's awesome. It's cool. It's a piece of hardware that I can give my baby boy. Because I didn't eat anything before. You know, absolutely. Hold on, I'm talking, brother. 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 Hello and welcome back to Hold on, I'm talking, brother. My name is Joe Greenwood, and you are listening to our UFC 279 preview: Chimaev versus Diaz in the welterweight division of the UFC, and Tom Ballam. I've got a question for you about this card. This is this doesn't feel like a fight card. This feels like a personality contest, I think. That is the main takeaway I'm getting from this. And as such, I feel like that is taking away from the actual fight itself. Am I crazy or is this what the UFC actually wants? One can only suspect so, Joe, uh because it certainly doesn't make sense on fighting terms. No. Uh, as we'll be discussing right now with Chimaya versus Diaz in the main event. Yeah. How are you feeling will... about that? Um, tepid. Uh, like, you know, it's it's like when you someone asks if you want a drink when you're thirsty. And you're like, oh, yeah, great. And then, like, your mind starts to, to wonder, of like, oh, what are they going to bring to me? And it's like, oh, here's a glass of water I've had out for three days. Do you want to? Do you want to have that? It's just like, yeah, cheers, thank you. Um, this is that's how I feel about this. It's bizarre booking. Well, we'll get into that. But listeners, me and Tom are going to make predictions for this card, and we have some rules for this because Tom is the uh, current defending predictions champion, defended his belt successfully uh, over his UFC Paris predictions. Uh, we're going to go through each fight. We're going to pick. Uh, on the main card, we're going to pick a fighter who we think is going to win, and if we get that correct, that's one point, and if we get the method correct as well, that's two points. Ten points on offer today. Let's go to the main event. Hamza Chimaev versus Nate Diaz in a welterweight bout here. And to put it simply, this is the UFC cashing in on Nate Diaz's personality and pay-per-view drawing potential. Joe, it's it's absolute nonsense, is what it is. On fight, <laughs> <laughs> listen to me. Look, on fight terms, this fight does not make sense. That you cannot put these guys together in the interest of sport. It's it's a freak show. Uh, I can't justify it. Can you find it, a way to justify this? You mean like as a competitive fight? Yeah, please do. Um, I think what people want to imagine happening is the way is their way of justifying it for me personally i can't do it but we know the argument i'm, I'm ready to make. imagine my eyes are closed i'm listening close i'm tuning in close your eyes how does it look you know to, you got the you got enya on low you're in the bath you got candles going right <sighs> okay round three hamzat signs a tire he's, he's put a beating on nate but how, how is he tired i don't get it already it doesn't make just sense just for beating him up too much he's beating him up so much that he's, <laughs> right. he's just tired this is like, plausible so tired. right and then nate he hits a one two and hamzat pauses and nate points at him he smiles and then he slaps him and then he starts unloading one twos and just getting in his face dirty boxing and uh, just puts his cardio the, the on The crowd are cheering. Chimaev's crowd crestfallen. Insane. He doesn't oh know what's God. happened. His corner are like screaming at him. There's a guy like waving a towel in his face to try and cool him down. And Nate... Don't is, let like, him bully you, son. Don't let him yeah. bully you. <laughs> yeah, some guy from, from Birmingham starts yelling at <laughs> Hamza. And that is how Nate Diaz then turns it on, turns the fight around. Maybe doesn't win it, but he get he wins with a bit of credit. Joe, or comes back with a bit of credit. You should write fantasy <laughs> because that is one of the wildest things uh, it's possible think, for the human mind to imagine. That that's. Do not you think happen. HBO would give me a budget of a hundred million to make this as a ten-part <laughs> fantasy think, series? Uh, I think Jeff Bezos and Amazon they'd be like, look, let's scrap this Lord of the Rings nonsense. Let's get. <laughs> An even greater fantasy fantasy series yeah. off the ground. Nate Diaz beating Hamzat Chimaev. That is absurd. It's What's going to happen, Joe, it? is that uh, Chimaev is going to run through Diaz, slice like a knife through butter, ground him and pound him out. And that's going to happen yeah. in round one. Yeah, I've got the exact same prediction. 
Uh, I've got Hands Up by Knockout. Uh, I've got it in round two. And do you know the fight that popped into my head as we were just talking about it was Amanda Nunes versus Ronda Rousey. Do you, that beat down was so severe. This much. And, and it was sad. It was sad watching Rousey get beaten up that badly. And I fear for Nate in that sense of he... I think he could get a beat down here as bad, if not worse than that. Like, you know, there are guys who go into fights that you feel like can dominate, and they do dominate, but the other guy who loses, it's like, okay, it's not that bad. Yeah, they lost. They lost to Khabib. You know, they lost to John Jones. They lost, you know, convincingly, but it's like, okay, they got a bit of dignity and pride about it. I think this could be a dignity sapping beating that Nate could take from Hamzat here and I don't think that that's insane we're talking about a guy who in Nate was a career lightweight who then fought a welterweight because he couldn't be bothered to cut and Hamzat who barely makes 170 and can fight at 185 comfortably yeah and Nate Diaz not not on the juice no no could do no. with some juice here Joe because it's um, I just don't know how he's going to get Jeremiah off of him I don't know how he's going to earn any respect I think GMI is going to have his way with him. I guess the only way out for Nate is to just just tap, just just let it you know, fold. You know, kind of like, right, Derek Lewis at heavyweight. He always looks like he's on the verge of, of kind of, yeah. you know, he, he always looks hurt and you're kind of like, all right, just just call it off. Now, now Lewis isn't hurt, but, but yeah. Nate will be, he will be hurt before he gets knocked out. When he's hurt, yeah. he should just let the ref stop the fight. Yeah, you know what you I mean. mean? Like That's... Take a knee, take yeah, a knee, take, sort of thing. Exactly. Of like... Yeah, fold a, fold against the cage, kind of emphasise that you're in pain, and to the on hum- humanitarian grounds, the ref is just like, no, this is, this is not sport. Mm. That's best mm. case scenario for Nate Diaz, Joe. Yeah, it, it's it's hard to envision. It's it's hard to envision, by the way, Nate being able to take these punches. Like Hamzat's going to come flying out there. You know what Nate's going to do. He's going to have that boxing style. He's going to rely on that. He's going to be heavy on the lead foot. And Hamzat's going to either swipe at that brutally or he's just going to come charging down the middle with just punches like straight to Nate Diaz. Hard one-twos. Just unloading on him. And you can really... Uh, yeah, I think I was generous by saying round two. I, th- I think Hamzat gets this done round one, really. Like, this is... It's going to be bad. And, like, on the ground, like, people talk about, oh, well, Nate, he's good off his back and whatnot. Bro, like, when was the last time someone who was, like, really good off his back meant anything in, like, yeah, a I big mean, time fight? I, let me tell you who's good on their back, Joe. Gilbert Burns. Yeah. All right. Gilbert Burns is phenomenal off did, his back. And did Hamzat that... didn't go diving and diving in there, did he? No. Like... No, no, he didn't. No, he didn't. But he was still ready to... He was ready to be on the mat with him. Yeah. You know? It, like, I... <sighs> Yeah, sorry, Nate. This is um... yeah. Well, it, this it's, is <laughs> it's going to be a it's going to be a sad affair, isn't it? I, I I just don't see any other any other conclusion now. It's up there for us to be proven wrong. I'm trying to see the other side, Joe. I'm trying to see what people might see in this fight. I'm trying to see it from a UFC <laughs> brand perspective. Um, but in sporting terms, it makes no sense. And and that could is, this that could is this up. do the UFC damage brand wise? Like, because this is like as close to like a uh, nonsense boxing I mean, match that we're going to get. A, a death is bad for the brand. <laughs> now, heaven forbid, yeah. heaven forbid. But if Nate really, if he's really going to be in there with Hamzat Jemaev and he's not going to quit and he's not going to get knocked out, you know, if you're going to make <sighs> Hamzat TKO you, God, you, mm. I, 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 just, I don't think you worry. I, I actually. I actually don't think Nate will allow that. I think Nate's aware enough that he will be willing to just take the TKO, as you say, Derek Lewis covering up loss. Or, like, or I Nick, think Nick Diaz in the fourth round against Robbie Lawyer. Yeah, Lord. Nick Diaz against Robbie Lawyer, yeah. Or even between rounds. Why not just be like, nah, I'm all right. I've had my fix. Like, I don't need any more. Mate, I would respect that so much. Let yeah. me take back, I take back best case scenario for Nate. That is the best case scenario. He makes it back to the corner and he's just like, nah, I'm not going back yeah. out there. That would be amazing. That, I that would, would respect him. Amazing. And that would make him, you know, 
more of a credit to the sport. I think we are going to circle back uh, at the end of this pod to look at Nate mm-hmm. and his his position in the sport, how he should be regarded. Um, yeah. But Let's in terms of the fight, it's a Hamzat KO. Hamzat KO for me as well. Let's move on. I've had enough of this. Let's fight. move this on. Is, Let's move is, on. Now, the problem nonsense. is, Joe, we've got to move on to another... <laughs> Nonsense. <laughs> Another fight that puts us in this, you know, Tony Ferguson. He okay. is in the rankings. Well, the man the this podcast king. is named for, the, yeah. one of the most quotable men in in the UFC. He is uh, he's entering this kind of slightly clownish position. Mm. He's fighting uh, uh, Li Jing Liang uh, up at welterweight. Obviously, Tony Ferguson, <laughs> career lightweight, so he's jumping up those fifteen pounds. He looks a little bit, a little bit soft around the tummy this this week. I don't know if you've seen the pictures and whatnot. And he also has rather tragic uh, dyed hair, uh, almost custard yellow. Uh, it reminds me of uh, what my dad did when he uh, got his mid- into his mid thirties as well. My dad dyed his hair blonde for a while, and uh, it was a rather embarrassing sight, uh, to be honest with you. Um, this is like what uh, my question here is. What does Tony Ferguson have to gain from doing this, other than a paycheck? Like, what? what are well, we I'll, at? I'll, I'll, I'll take that and run with it, Joe. If he can beat the leech, uh, he, if he can beat the leech at welterweight, he is a big lightweight. Uh, wow, wow, that that would be that would be very exciting. And you suddenly look up there in welterweight; it's a whole new set of matchups. And yeah, I, I I would like to see some of those matchups if if he could beat the leech. So he, it would be rejuvenation for him. Is is there the theory then that he's moved up a division because maybe that weight cut became too hard and it's compromised his chin with the beatdowns, and so moving up to welterweight might be a bit easier for him. But then also, bro, the leech is a brutal finisher. Like like he well, he's got a let's, crazy let's amount just talk, of knockouts, talk about that, Joe. Let's just talk about that. Yeah, I mean, he's coming off a knockout of, uh, you know... Muslim Salikov. Yeah, exactly. The Kung Fu King. Um, much hype for his own striking and, and wheel kicks, but Leach put him away in two rounds. Before that, the last win was uh, Ponzinibbio, uh, yeah. one of the one of the big bangers at, at welterweight. Before put that, him put him away. First round. Good night, son. Uh, mm. And then, you know, you've got... Two knockouts before that in his in his other wins. You know, he's eight nineteen and seven now overall. His mm. recent losses have come against Hamzat, which um certainly put Hamzat on the on the map mm-hmm. as a you know, as a one to watch. So it's a tough ask for Tony. It's a tough yeah. ask. Ha- what do you see a successful Tony Ferguson fight looking like? I th- <laughs> I don't know, man. Like I honestly I was thinking Well like- Joe like okay, Tony Ferguson basically he has to maybe draw the leech into him so that then he can maybe get a takedown from there. Uh, he has to then I don't know if that's possible. The leech has got really good takedown defense if you're not Hamza Chimaev, and then he also has to sort of maybe circle away from the sort of power punches as well and uh, sort of uh, get his sort of combinations in maybe going backwards. The thing is, Tony Ferguson's never been a backwards fighter. He's always been walking forward. You know, trying to put pressure on people, getting them backed up against the cage, and it's like if you're just walking in towards the leech, that's not a good idea here. See, like, yeah, see, you well, Joe. See, like I, uh, I agree with parts of what you're saying there, but um, it did come out this week that Tony actually went into the Chandler fight with the idea to land an inside trip and put Chandler on his back and sub him early. That's what they wanted to achieve. In oh, the really? Camp. That's and it, but then he got up, squared up with Chandler, and saw it's not so easy to to get into that grappling exchange and to mm. get uh, Chandler into position for those trips. He was a bit stronger and had a better base than I think Tony was expecting. And that's what led to the fight that we had. Now, that fight, Tony was working him in the first round. You know, he he, he won that round. Uh, um, he had his... No. No, Chandler won that first round. He took him down. He had that big takedown. He had the ground and pound from there for like the last two minutes of that round. For me, Chandler won that round. But I know what you're going to say. I'm biased towards Michael Chandler. I've got a hard-on for Michael Chandler. Joe, there's a, poster, there's a poster on your wall right now. <laughs> and it's shirtless Michael Chandler. Uh, yeah, well, you've uh, got to have some body goals, haven't you? Um, anyway, look. I, it, go on. I gave, it to, I gave it to Tony. Um, Fair enough. 
I guess maybe I'm a bit biased towards him. But he, you know, he had the volume. He had the variety on the feet. I thought it was going pretty well. He's playing pr- pretty safe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, but he, anyway, it wasn't going cool. along with the game plan that he had. Uh, now, I wouldn't want to see him try and implement that game against the Leech. What do you think um, he should go for? Oh, I think it has to be like... I do think he has to have forward pressure. I do think he has to be unconventional, throwing his 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 elbows, getting in and out of kind yes. of clinch-type positions and, and working, working with volume. Um, and at the same time, circling away from that power hand uh, that the leech has. Now, he is, he is biased towards one side, the leech, and I think Tony's camp will pick up on that. Mm. So, you know, I think if he can stay, stay out of danger, I, I think there is a path for victory to, to, for, for Tony. Yeah, I mean, of course there, there's a path. It's whether he can physically do that. He's now training at Jackson Wink, so he's at an actual proper camp now that will be game planning properly rather than why don't you just throw an Imanari role it, it, oh. It, it, oh God, infamous, oh, infamous. It? a moment that will live in infamy just insane anyway um, sorry that's just to my breath what are we referencing there Joe just for those who, who might when not be in Ferguson there. fought Gaethje uh, in Jacksonville in the first card uh, when Covid hit in the main event for the interim lightweight title and I rewatched this fight a couple of weeks ago. Oof. I know, man. I know. And Master Ferguson fist. Ferguson is just getting battered from pillar to post by Gaethje. He lands a nice uppercut at the end of the second, but you can see Gaethje's locked in, and you can see that Ferguson's frustrated. Tony and goes to his corner for advice. He goes to his corner for Save me. What, what, what do, do I, I do? What do I do? And Eddie Bravo comes in, his jiu-jitsu coach. And this is a stand-up fight, and the jiu-jitsu coach is in there. And Eddie Bravo's talked about this, where he's like, he felt like he was thrown in there and had no idea what to do. And Eddie's just talking to him. He's like, you know, I to, you may have to throw something unconventional. You might have to try an Imanari roll or something. It's like, that's not advice to be going like, throw an Imanari roll. Like, go roll at his legs. Like, it's just not going to work, is it? And then it was quite funny. Then they cut to the other corner and Trevor Whitman's there. He's like, he's going to start doing weird weird stuff. Keep, keep focus. And you can hear his corner going like, he's going to start rolling at your legs. Like, be careful. <laughs> so they had that scouted once Eddie Bravo walked in there. Anyway, enough of this nonsense. The leech is knocking him out. That's that's what's going to happen oh, in this card. No. Leech by knockout. No. Don't say he's going to get words, smoked, Jay. bro. He's going to And I love Tony Ferguson. He's one of my absolute all-time favorite fighters. But he's getting cashed out here, along with Nate Diaz. And this is dark, dark days, I think, for Tony. You say cashed out. What is there to be gained for for the Leech beating Tony? Like, that's, it's that's it's a nice, nice name on his record. I can guarantee you when Tony Ferguson comes out, he will have the biggest pop of the night up until that moment. He is going to it's going to feel like a superstar just walked out there. And the Leech is going to walk out, he's going to get booed, and then he's going to knock him out. He is going to absolutely brutalise Tony Ferguson. Ferguson's not going to be able to take him down, and he can't trade with him. <laughs> Joe? Come on. I've picked Tony Ferguson. <laughs> <No>! <laughs> what? I, I've done it, Joe. I've, You've done I've it. I've picked you Tony Ferguson by decision. <gasps> no, I, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it, Joe. You can't help I want it. it. I want it so badly. I can't watch Tony got, get knocked out knocked again. Out, he got knocked out. Joe, I know. Sh- don't tell ago. me the. Fa- don't tell me the odds, well, Joe. Don't tell now. me the facts. I picked Tony Ferguson. He's gonna. It's gonna be vintage Tony. He's gonna roll. He's like he's gonna roll with the punches. Uh, he's gonna eat some to land some. His his forward pressure is gonna shock the leech. Leech is gonna get that look in his eye. There's gonna be terror spreading through him. Tony's oh. gonna get weird. Elbows are gonna be coming. The leech will be in full retreat, and Tony will reign again. I now, I mean, to, I almost want to throw up. This is, <laughs> uh, Joe. I cannot watch Tony Ferguson get knocked out again. It's happening. That crushed me. That oh, beautiful knockout, though it was. Yeah. That Chandler knockout was just. That was uh, talking about disgusting. It was that upsetting. Was, uh, it was, was traumatizing, especially given the like dark eye bags under under Tony when he'd been training all night in his garage yeah. going and, he, and talking about how he had to win oh, for the sake God. of those around him Joe Tony cannot oh. get knocked out I, again. I forgot about that promo stuff about him like oh he's training in his garage now and it's just like and some guy's like yeah we're training at two o'clock in the morning I don't know why I'm here like let me out <laughs> like his high school wrestling coach it's like it's like Tony like I mean Matt Matt Brown is sat there 
right? He sat there and not fighting Nate Diaz or Tony Ferguson on this card. Like, mm. this is this is silly, isn't it? Like, this what about is Tony, t- Tony and Nate? You know, why don't you just swap over? Let, yeah. Let the, let the leech have a t- shot again at Hamza. <laughs> <laughs> if you told me the main event of this card was Hamza versus Colby and the co-main was Diaz versus Ferguson. Yeah, that sounds fun, yeah. That, that sounds, sounds a good card. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's yeah. going into this card going like, I'm about to watch one of my fan favourites die, but... Hey, but what about a vintage performance? Tony wins it. All right, that sounds good to me too. Now, yeah, it sounds lovely. On to the one of the new boys, the new favourites, yes. Kevin Holland. He, he's fighting a uh, pretty legitimate challenger yeah. in Daniel Rodriguez. Yeah, uh, Daniel This Rodriguez. is an exciting fight, Joe. This is uh, one that I we can this. really get into now. Proper fight. I, re- I really, really love this fight. This is so good. I mean, this is a catchway. It's at 180. I think it was probably Rodriguez couldn't make it down to 170 because that is a wide, muscular man. Um, he is... Um, Daniel Rodriguez is like he's so hard to look good against. He kind of it's kind of like the Sean Brady thing of like all right, you, P. You, Kevin Lee. Yeah, exactly. You can't look good against this guy, basically. So that's going to be the challenge for Holland, um, because Holland is like he's so like unorthodox and strange, and he'll throw sort of weird kicks and elbows at different angles. Whereas Rodriguez is very grindy, is he? He's got very high frequency that he throws at like strikes. Great job fantastic jab it just works behind that the whole way um you know uh what, what, what's the what's the what's his numbers here he's got crazy numbers i'll bring it up in a second but yeah he's he's really sort of the word grindy makes it sound like boring it's not he's kind of a, he's a bit of an action fighter but it's not like doesn't get like finishes per se here we go he's he lands at 8.06 per minute. That is enormous. S- that's enormous at 50% striking accuracy. So he's throwing about 16 strikes per minute. That's so much. That's so much. He absorbs, though, 5.38 because obviously he puts himself in that position um, to get hit on to by landing so much. But he is so difficult to beat. But Lee is going to have um, quite the he's reach gone, advantage. Joe. Oh, sorry, Kevin, uh, he's uh, gone, Joe. Kevin Let Holland, it go, sorry. man. He's Kevin. Holland. He was dispatched by Daniel Rodriguez, put he away, was. and cut from the UFC immediately. He was. Uh, that was that was quite shocking, and it also really established actually Daniel Rodriguez. He's a name, you know. He's good. But he's um, six in his last seven, just dropping the one decision to uh, Nicholas Dalby. Mm. Um, now look, Kevin Holland himself, Joe. He's he's been. Having a mixed a mixed time, you know, he blew up the fighter of 2020, one of mm. them, um, with his famous five wins. Mm. Then had a difficult period against two wrestlers, Derek Brunson and Marvin Vittori, but he's on the come up again now. Alex Oliveira, for what it's worth, that was mm. a TKO, and then and then Tim Means. Yeah. So he's being tested again. Tested solid. again. Is it? It's two solid wins to get him into a guy like Rodriguez, who's potential ranking contender um yeah this is this is the difficult thing for holland now isn't it it's just like can he get through this test of rodriguez um i think obviously he's got that seven inch reach advantage but the thing is kevin lee had that as well uh but kevin lee is not as dynamic a striker as as holland um which is why tom i've gone for a kevin holland decision yeah, Joe, it's the logical choice. I mean, we didn't quite get into Holland's game there, but he's he's a very awesome. very accurate. Ac- well, he's a he's a great he's a great striker. Um, yeah, he uses that range. Um, mm. He can really switch it up in terms of you know he he doesn't just pick power shots. He doesn't just no. plod away with a jab. He he chooses the appropriate strikes. If it's going to be a matchup on the feet, there's not too many who can hang with him at, at middleweight. Um, Let alone welterweight. He's yeah. very methodical, you know. Even though he can throw and do strange things, he he really his, his timing is excellent. Like he when he throws, he tends to land quite a bit. And yeah, I don't know. I, I, the one that always pops into my mind is like I know this the Jacare one was like such an insane knockout that he got from his back. But like I think about the Joaquin Buckley one. Yeah, that's where same, it, same. it was so neat. Just like just right hand, just like. Straight down the middle yeah. that like Buckley couldn't get to, um, and yeah, I, that, that's why that I'm kind of 
leaning this way. If Rodriguez mixes in some wrestling and sort of clinch work and presses Holland again up against the fence and maybe tries to work on him from there and yeah, I mean maybe you could see Rodriguez starting to take rounds from him, but Holland has such dynamic striking and also knockout ability, which is pretty rare at welterweight, I feel like. Yeah, you can't trade with Kevin Holland. Um, and I think he will have to show some versatility um, mm. because I think Daniel Rodriguez, he will be ready to mix that game in. So a really good good fight. One of The winner of this fight, he enters the rankings for me. Um, yeah. Kevin even Holland by a, decision. Yeah, even though it is a catchweight fight, this is a, this is a welterweight fight. Actually, can I talk about this? Is this the only good fight on this card now that I'm thinking <laughs> about it? Like, this is... Uh, well, well, let's get to the next one then. Um Irene Aldana. Yeah, she wins by decision, Joe. Yeah, it's Macy Chia's son. Um, yeah, she's got a higher output and she has better wins. So, yeah, Macy Chia's... Oh, uh, sorry, uh, Irene Aldana by decision. I almost made a massive mistake there. <laughs> Irene Aldana by decision there. Right, let's move on from that to um, the light heavyweight fight uh, on this card. Johnny Walker versus... Eon Kutalaba. Now, Holland versus Rodriguez, that's the best fight on this card. Walker versus Kutalaba, that's the funniest fight on this card. Is it not? <laughs> See, this was my question, Joe. Where, how do we put these guys? Where do they stand in the UFC? Are they now these kind of outside the rankings? Yes. Clown, clownish, you know? Yeah. Nate bro, Diaz, like, Conor McGregor. I mean, Wait, hold, well, they don't have the celebrity, obviously, uh, but. They, de- they should. They, especially Eon. That man is he's intense. Um Yeah, I mean they're at this point whereby if you're ranked, let's say, eight to fifteen at light heavyweight and you lose two in a row, you're getting Johnny Walker and Eon Kusilaba to get you back on track, Volcan. Like you're gonna be you're gonna be alright, bro. Yeah, I mean this is a hilarious fight. Um th- But we Johnny like Walker, it. We like it, we like it. This is fun. Like it kind of reminds me of the um I can't remember the card exactly, but I remember that uh, it opened with Thiago Santos versus Jimmy Manoa on the main <laughs> card, where it's That's just like, funny. this fight is not going the distance. Um, I would be amazed if this, fight, if, if this fight goes around, really. Johnny Walker, um, let's get this out there. He is in trouble, like, <laughs> career-wise. Uh, yeah. Once was billed as the guy to potentially beat John Jones. Uh, that was before COVID, Joe. That was a weird time. I can't remember yeah. that world, but apparently yeah. so. Yeah. Um, came in, had some incredible knockouts. He had the one over Roundtree. Do you remember that elbow? That was really fant- quite fantastic. Holded Justin Ledette, hook kick with a spinning back fist. Round one. Misha Serkinov, flying knee with punches. That was oh fantastic. And then he fought Corey Anderson and got knocked out in the first round. And everyone thought he's going to beat Corey Anderson and get the title shot against Jones. We think, God, could this guy? What's he got? No. Loses to Krilov. And then where he was really dominating that one. Gets a win over Ryan Spann despite almost losing it. And then has an incredibly boring decision loss to Thiago Santos. And then loses to Jamahal Hill um, a couple months ago, six months ago. Do you remember that knockout? Of course. Of course. I live longer than memory. Uh, Span. You can see it at any any kind of old car, used car sale lot. Yes. Uh, where they've got those inflatable men who just flop around from yeah. <laughs> up and down in the wind. Uh, that was Johnny Walker in that fight. One of the yeah. most hilarious comedic ways of going down I've, I've ever seen. But thunderous and a little bit tragic at the same time. Very much so. Uh, he faces Eon Kutilaba, who um, he's in a he's in a dark place, man. He's in a dark place. He had all those. He had the two fights with Ankalaev. The first one. Do you remember the first one where he pretended he was Rock to draw Ankalaev in, um, and then the ref called it off, and everyone's like, "Oh, he can't do that." Had that fight booked three times, cancelled each time. Finally fought Ankalaev again. Of course, Ankalaev smoked him. Uh, had a draw with Justin, uh, Dustin Jacoby. Uh, beat Devin Clark, and then lost to your boy Ryan Spann by guillotine choke. Um, He's a he's an up and down guy. Even within fights, he's up and down. First round, he sort of explodes and tries to get people out of there. Um, 
Originally, that that was the the breakdown that you, you could easily go to for long, Young Kuta Labri. Just you really try to implement a lot of um, athleticism, and of course, he is a pretty hulking, hulking mm. guy. Um, and he, look, you know, he's quite quite terrifying, honestly. Um, yeah. But I have seen glimpses uh, in the aforementioned Dustin Jacoby fight, and especially against Devin Clark, uh, of a ma- of a maturing of Young Kuta Labri, pacing himself, implementing a wrestling game. Um, mm-hmm. Holding people down, and you know, uh, granted it was against Devin Clark, but I thought we might have the makings of a of a top fifteen light heavyweight. Yeah, a sort of yeah, a decent ranked fighter who you know it's a it's a roadblock fighter. You know, it's a guy who if you can't get past him, there's no way that you can fight Glover Teixeira or Anthony Smith or anyone above. You know, in that sort of eight up. Um. Yeah. Having said that, though, Tom, I've gone for a Johnny Walker knockout here because I think that would be uh, the funniest outcome. Uh, that's uh, that was my ha- pick. Walk me through it, Joe. How do you how do you see it going? I see Walker throwing something mad, landing it on Kutalaba. Kutalaba going rage mode, and then uh, comes swanging back, knocks Walker down twice, and then Walker <laughs> lands something ridiculous to knock him down. Kutalaba comes back, he knocks him down. I, you know, I'm I'm seeing rock and sock and robots here. I, that's what I'm hoping for. Give it I to don't me. think uh, I think these two, it's like did you see the nineties version of Romeo and Juliet with DiCaprio and Claire Danes? The bit where they lock eyes through the fish tank and they fall in love immediately. These two are gonna look at each other from across the cage and they're thinking I'm going to do something crazy with this man, and uh, we will see something crazy. I'm not saying it's going to be good, but it will be crazy. Yeah, let's hope that is the outcome rather than uh, the mentioned fight that you just gave against um, Moretta, against Tiago Santos, where mm. you would have expected some fireworks and we just got a, a stalemate. Um, now, I've also picked Walker by knockout. Have <laughs> you? Uh, I expect... A firefight nearly fell back off off your chair with that great prediction of mine. I mean, um, I don't know. It's, it's it's I guess it's still the promise of of Walker that lives in the mind. I don't know. I feel like a peak Johnny Walker. So tempting. It, yeah, it, I like that. I like the sound of that, and I feel like the the peak for Johnny is is above the likes of Kutalaba. Um, you know, like you just do something with that six foot six frame that he has you know that the strength yeah. the power the athleticism that landed those crazy knockouts that got him going in the ufc i just feel like he should be beating yon kutalaba but there is a part of me that worries that yon will, will, will take him down and and just ground him out like that i, I can also see that outcome absolutely winning by decision is... yon kutalaba yeah but you've gone for johnny walker by knockout wow I have. quite the pick quite the pick Right, Tom, let's go have a look at the prelims. There's not a lot there, but we do have Hakim Dawadu. He's back. He's facing uh, Julian Arosa. That should be fun. No, Dawadu's fun. He's got good fun combos. But Joe, I, I you, like... you, well, you well know I spent five minutes rubbishing Julian Arosa when you brought this up as <laughs> our pick for the prelims. It is, Let's be though. honest, bro, it's, it's slim pickings, right? Um, I'm trying to learn yeah. more about some of these fighters on the prelims. There's no Wikipedia pages, mate. We're in some <laughs> a dark. <laughs> we're in a dark place. Let's not even talk about the early prelims. Yes, Hakim Dawadu is the only fighter with with kind of known potential and should beat the likes of Julian Arosa. Yeah, d- d- this is one where I'm thinking if Dawadu can style on Arosa here, could get a nice matchup in, at featherweight. That's what I want to see here. Um, otherwise, yeah, as you say, this is this is real. Like, okay, let's hope we can find something to talk about or something to see. You know, someone that maybe we're not really thinking about that could shine through. But oof, it's it's rough going down there. Right, let's talk about. Should we talk about the fight night card that we just had that we previewed last week? Well, from the lows to the highs, um, this was sublime. There were certainly some big moments there. Uh, yeah, I guess the defining moment is Cyril Garn, future heavyweight champ, uh, being crowned in front mm. of his home crowd in Paris. A raucous crowd 
who yeah. were treated to an absolutely delicious spectacle. Totally yeah. with us surpassing expectations. Uh, he put some questions out there for Garn to answer. Yeah, he really did. It was it was the most pride looking fight I've seen in such a long time. Like big muscly roided dude versus chubby, you know, uh <laughs> Australian poke. You know, stocky. He's there to, stocky. 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 He's there to swang and bang. This is tremendous. Like I was I was watching this the morning after. I was I was making some noises. My god, it, it moved me. Like this was incredible. And it's one of those where both guys come out with a lot of credit and also questions about them. It's Tui Vasa can be of this level with the right matchup. Garn was never going to be that. But he made it close and Garn had to respond from that knockdown in the second round. That second round was incredible. Well, in the spirit of, of Nate Diaz and, and taking fights, you know, I want to credit Tui Vasa for stepping in there in Paris as for me, an overwhelming uh, underdog, about yeah. as big as they come for me in this type of matchup, even though it was, I think, second versus first uh, in the rankings. So huge credit to Ty. He mm. did ask those questions. He did uh, a great job in cutting off the cage uh, and kind of maneuvering Garn into that into that right hand. Yeah. Um, made he it a good fight. It. Didn't lose his head. No. The finish, though, you know, from Garn like, was tremendous, though. He, he, he really poured it on well, I mean, Tui Vasa in the end. Well, Joe, look, look mate. He, but he'd raked the gut of Tui Vasa with those uh, those vicious kicks for, for mm. so long that Tui, Tui you know, uh, Tui Vasa, he couldn't take it anymore. His hands dropped totally yeah. to the point where he got clapped in the face and he still didn't take his hands away from his stomach because he didn't want mm. any more of that smoke. Yeah. And that, that left the opening for Garn to get the finish. I think the key was the the kicks to the to the midriff. Yeah. Would you not say? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And I actually think now uh, Cyril Garn's next fight should be a title fight, interim or not. Like I, I think that is the thing to do. I just I I want see I wanted Francis and Garnu versus Taito Ivasa. There are so many matchups I still want for Francis Joe, and. I just worried Garn, he's, he's so good. He's, he's so good. goddamn good. And he's still going to be good. You know, let's just chill out a little bit. Francis beat him. Garn can go and win another fight. Come on, he's lost the... F- he's, he, Blades? He, oh, see, now you're asking a question. Yeah. that You're asking a proper question. Blades is right there for me. Um, you know, he can't do anything about the fact that Aspinall was injured in their fight. Mm. If Garn beats Blades, I cannot protest anymore. All right. Yeah. And now in Garno, he beat Blades. He beat him twice, Joe. So yeah. Garn, you go and prove that, and I won't be able to argue with it. There's better fights for Garno right now. You're not telling me though that like if they booked Jones versus Garn in January, once Francis has left, which I by the way I don't think Francis is going to leave the UFC. I, I really don't think you don't think so. Happen. I don't think he's going to leave. I think yeah, he could make crazy money from a Tyson Fury fight. You know, but like, is he going to go in there with Deontay Wilder or Andy Ruiz? and Or is he just going to go in there and box people that are like well below his level? If he's going to do that, that's fine. You can cash those easy checks, you know, and just knocking out fools. But like, if he's going to be a proper fighter and a proper competitor, I think he should just stay in the UFC. I think they should pay him properly. Because this oh, guy, of course, that's what we want. I don't want to lose Francis. Jesus, of course. No, I don't, I don't want to lose him to, I don't want to lose him to. The boxing nonsense. It would that be a tragedy to lose prime Francis and mm. to meme fights. Are you? Yeah. That's blasphemy. Let's not even mention that possibility. A prey stays with the UFC. Uh, now mm. you mentioned Jones versus Khan. Yes. Mm. Yes is my answer. That that sounds great. Um, Stepe versus, versus Jones. Uh, Stepe versus Khan. A little bit less hype there. Oh J- come on. Jones versus Stepe. Garn versus uh, Blades and Nganu versus. Who's t- that guy that uh, that knocked out Derek Lewis the other the other month? Rachmanov. Yeah. Rachmanov or Pavlovich? No. Uh, Pavlovich. Pavlovich. Rachmanov lost to Tybura last month. Uh, a couple. Of weeks <laughs> yeah. Ago. Yeah. Not the same thing. All right. Can we talk about something else that is sublime? 
Robert Whittaker just continues to deliver. This man, there's nothing like Bobby Knuckles, is there? Like, we absolutely love this guy. And his performance was... It was sublime, is the word for it. And it was a complete schooling of a very good fighter in Marvin Vittori. Yeah, well, perhaps to help help you break that one down, Joe. I mean, the first round, it was the only questionable round. It was pretty close. And then Robert made some adjustments going to the second and the third. Mm. What was so what what did he what was so good about his performance in those rounds? Well, it was the boxing that came in there. It was he hit a sweet takedown as well. I think it was in the second round where he just caught and the third. Oh yeah, he just caught Vittori flat footed and just took him down. And admittedly Vittori got straight back up, but still he was taken down. It was the kicking game as well of Whitaker. And the commentary pointed this out and they're correct to do this. Whitaker didn't do anything out of the ordinary for himself. It was just uh-huh. how he mixed it all up there. It was just oh, Nah, he just he just perfect. accelerated. He accelerated away from Vittori. It was really yeah. it, it was a schooling. Uh disappointing performance for Vittori, but he's just he, he has got a limit, you know? That's and, the problem. And he, his limit, Joe, is he just can't hit people hard enough. He just doesn't carry any power. He needs no. to go to a trainer, uh, you know, someone like uh, Trevor Whitman. <laughs> Not that oh, he would take him. No. But someone who can coach him um, to punch, Joe, to pun- to connect pe- with people at the end of his punches. He's, a- he's an arm puncher. There's something yeah. missing there. You know, he, there's just no he, pop to his shots. Th- this is the thing that I got from this fight, which is Vittori does everything really well but he has nothing that's exceptional about him which makes him a really good well-rounded fighter but like those guys that just have that little extra bit of magic you know Adesanya with the striking or Khabib with the grappling or Usman with the wrestling that he's had and whatever else it's just he just doesn't have that little special thing that can elevate him up he can beat everyone else he can beat pretty much everyone else at middleweight and I would favor him over everyone else except Robert Whittaker and Israel Adesanya, because he just doesn't have that special skill that those two guys have. You know, he's not as diminished in other areas that other guys are that have specialised, and he's not as good as them at their specialist areas, but he'd be able to beat them because he could then use the skills that he's better at them with. But Joe, like, do you not feel that if he could just add in that that threat... Mm. Um, just heavier hands, you know, hands that hurt you through the yeah, guard, but, uh, hands where that pressure can tell. I, I think that's something that can be coached, you know, someone like uh, Perillo. You know, you, you just look at different different fighters that just suddenly they start carrying. You know uh, what? That's that's a good shout because Marlon, yeah, Marlon, Marlon Vera went to Perillo and he and now he's starts, knocking fools out, Joe. He, he was murking fools after that. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's a good shout, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. Yeah. I don't think I don't think I don't think this is the ceiling for Vittori. I still think like he is a Ubermensch, you know. He is a, he's designed in a vat. The guy is a, a hulking beast <clears throat> with great stamina, great <clears throat> fundamentals. Oh, well, sorry, great fundamentals. I mean, like very hard to take him down, very hard to hold him down, very hard to stop him taking you down, <clears throat> you know, impossible to make him fold. You know, the guy <clears throat> does not quit. He's going to be there in the 5th round. He's really, he's got a lot going for him. He just needs kind of chiseling. He just needs rounding off. And I feel like a striking coach can work wonders for for Tori. He's reached the limit with the camp he's in now. And Mm. if he can just, Joe, just imagine if he had some pop on those shots. Just imagine if he was hurting people. Yeah. It'd be a terrifying prospect. he He could go very far. He could go very, very far. Now, let's talk about this fight. Nazruddin Imavov defeats Joaquin Buckley by unanimous decision. Uh, on the judges' scorecard, too. 29-28, not in our hearts, though. 29-28 on two. And some fool gave it 30-27, which is, I mean... Bananas. Insane. Yeah. Terrible. Ability. There was some really right. bad judging on this card. Like, someone... To be honest, actually, I kind of feel like giving a round to Vittori was it's a bit generous, uh, if I'm being completely honest. The, f- the, first, the first round was close. It was close. Uh, there's no outrage. The second round and third round were just absolute clinics by by Whitaker. But yeah, anyway, yeah. I mean, Buckley let's, Joe, let's... he basically uh, won this fight in my mind. <laughs> Did you really? Now, well, look, look. 
Let me explain. Round, round one got... was the round you gave to him. No. Round two. No. Round three. Yeah. What? Buckley. So you're saying Buckley won the fight? Buckley won round three. He didn't win. No, no, he didn't win all three rounds. I'm oh, sorry. I was about to say like, what are you no, talking no, about? No, I, th- I thought you were telling me that you gave him round one. I was going to say, no, well, in that case, no, no, he, no, he no, definitely no. did win the fight because no, he 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 lost rounds one and definitely lost round two, obviously. Uh, yeah. But he won round three and he won it in pretty impressive fashion. In enough yeah. of a fashion that I felt, you know, if we had two more rounds. Which yeah. you would, if, you know, where Buckley's going to the top of the division, he'll be fighting five round fights. Yeah. Let's go, my man. And yeah. uh, he, he would have overcome Imamov. He proved a lot to me, Buckley. He went through some serious adversity. He got kind of worked in that second round. He got yeah. mounted. He got pounded. He yeah. got big brothered. And then he came out swanging, bro. And he was hurting Imamov. Imamov was folding. He looked tired as well in that round he looked That's, he he's, was he's trying struggling. to fight trying to fight Joaquin Joe he was he, <laughs> he was struggling he was massively struggling bro in that the fight. raw energy of that man Joaquin Buckley honestly I thought the fight was a credit to him we talk about you know again in the in the Nate Diaz style like losses how much do they matter this fight it doesn't matter that Joaquin no. lost get him in the rankings let's go yeah I'd have him over Chris Curtis in the rankings. I've had, I'd have him over Darren Till in the rankings. I would. Darren Gaston. Till versus Joaquin Buckley. That <laughs> Don't do that to me. Listen, I thought Buckley, he performed incredibly well. Even in the rounds he lost, you know, he was doing the right things. The problem was, was that he had to come in from so far. Like he's, yeah, br- to, like, he's tiny. <laughs> he's just like, no. compared, is it, Imamov is massive compared to him. I know, I know. But like, he had to throw seven, eight shot combos to land three shots at the very end, which was the problem. It worked in the third round because he had Imamov up against the fence. There was one combination where he landed where Imamov was flat against the cage. Flat, his back was flat. And Buckley crunched him with his right hand. You could see like Imovov's face like taking the full force of it. And you could see him like almost like crumble. And it credit to him for taking it, but Buckley was tremendous in this. And actually, it was one of those where I watched Imovov and I'm like, I do not fancy him against some of these guys up the division. Like against like a Strickland, a cannoneer, I do not fancy him there. He went backwards in a straight line with his hands down and his chin up in the air and he gassed in the third round after being in control of the fight. Mm. That's that's a worry, man. Like that's not good. I that's also not good. yes, I, I definitely hear what you're saying there, Joe. But I, I guess I feel like um how do I put this? Like he was assertive enough in the fight and had enough control uh, mm. and enough dominance that I think a lot of fighters would would fold in those conditions. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that for me, like if he gets into that kind of position against perhaps some of the fighters you mentioned there, I feel like he will be able to cruise on through. I really feel like the resilience of Buckley was was a surprise. Mm. Um, I like I like think about it. Right. You you mentioned um, the likes of Cannonier. Mm. Right. You think of Cannonier has been mounted in the second round in Paris and he's getting this big brother in from a bigger man. Mm. He's going to come out with that same kind of pop and movement like Buckley did in the third? Probably not, actually. That's a good show. That's a good show. Buckley, to his credit with this, he's always he's aware of the situations he's in. Like He's aware of the surroundings and he's aware of the moment that he's in. And what it means to have that fight in that position, you know, just behind Whitaker and Vittori, you know, it, it's a it's a big fight against the big French hope at middleweight. So he knows that moment. He's like, well, I don't want to lose here. I don't want to cruise to a decision loss. I've got to give myself a bit of honor. And as you say, coming out of that third round at the end of the fight, everyone's like, you know, what? Buckley gave himself a lot of credit and showed there's a lot of flaws to Imavov that. He needs to sort out, and I don't Joe, know. Yeah, I think I Joe, think Cannonier would wouldn't give that to him. Um, maybe Joe, Strickland sig- wouldn't be in that position anyway. I don't know. Significant Brunson? strikes in this fight: Imamov fifty-one, yeah. Buckley forty-six. Can you uh, can you go round by round potentially? 
I don't have that in front of me, unfortunately. Uh, I would. I suspect that the majority of those were in the third. I mean, total strikes, Buckley threw more. Uh, obviously, as you say, because he had to cover that distance, because Imamov was able to just, you know, wheel backwards with his chin in the <laughs> air. Uh, Buckley, he couldn't land at the same, you know, with the same accuracy, but he threw more strikes. Um, yeah. Despite Imamov having had that top control, you know, with the two takedowns. So... <sighs> Here we go. I've got, I've got the strikes here. Significant strikes. So uh, round one, Imavov 15, Buckley 10. Round two, Imavov 14, Buckley 10. Round three, Imavov 22, Buckley 26. So he really upped it in that last round. Um, yeah, it was... Yeah, I don't know. I, it was it was a one for me where I think Imavov needs to choose carefully his next matchup. Can't do that Nate Diaz thing of losses don't matter because... You lose one fight at middleweight, you're going to go plummeting back down the rankings. You've got to work your way back up there. He's got to choose a, a favorable matchup next time out. Right. Chris Curtis. Chris, maybe. Calvin Gastelum. Rem- rematch with Hawes. Ooh. That's going to be there, though, Joe. Let's not match up these young prospects. Let's clear yeah. out some of the dross. Jesus. Yes. Right. Should we talk about the news? Yeah. She's, uh, she's not with us. She's yeah. gone. Breaking news, uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, died today. Uh, also, Darren Till has been booked against uh, Drickers Duplessis for December 10th. Uh, he's back. Darren's back. Not the two fights in 2022 like he promised, but one. Um, and I'm going to say this. I think this is the best matchup he could have had out of any of the ranked fighters. Duplessis is a banger, Joe. He's an absolute banger. He doesn't, he doesn't, <laughs> doesn't take his foot off the gas for one minute. Bro, he uh, very forward like a lunatic in a straight with his line, chin, swinging chin like high. a toddler. But, uh, he certainly does, Joe. But has and, he been? Has he been uh, knocked out? Uh, I think Soldich put it on him, didn't he? In KSW, mm. I'd, I'll have to bring up his records. Uh, I wouldn't be too confident of Duplessis because, all right, if you're Darren Till, who's a Southpaw counter striker, you want a guy just running at you, don't you? Like that's ideal in a way. Yeah. The problem is, is that what if Duplessis starts like chaining these these sprints together, like sprint across the cage, sprint across the cage, <laughs> over and over again in straight. Well, lines. Joe, he he's gonna he did that against Brad Tavares, uh, and it was hilarious. It just came it, in a hilarious fashion. I don't know. I mean, Darren Till, that chin is is a little bit fragile, and I think it might get tested. Sounds like a fun fight. You are right, by the way, in uh, that Soldich did avenge a prior loss to Duplessis with a knockout in okay. in KSW. Um, okay. But that's the only uh, knockout loss on his record. Uh, mm. I don't know. That's certainly not a gimme. It's definitely not. Definitely not. Last piece of news. Tiago Santos, Tom, has joined the PFL. Oh. Um, mm. Yeah, gone to the retirement home. Not a good move <laughs> for previous UFC fighters. I'm talking about Anthony Pettis, who's lost four fights there. Rory McDonald, who kind of got chewed out there. Hopefully our boy Shane Burgos uh, does a lot better there. But yeah, Santos moving off to the PFL. The correct move, isn't it? Like, let's get him out of that sort of headlining spot. I, of can't, I can't, can't, defend him. can't defend him anymore. It's just that, you know, it's been said on the pod before, but... Uh, he made the ultimate sacrifice, or at least yeah. as close as it comes in, in MMA sporting terms, in that he sacrificed his future mobility for the chance of glory. Uh, for our entertainment but, but, in a loss. Oh, he is he is Nate Diaz. I, right. I, uh, I Yeah, a good career anyway from Santos, and he'll be missed, but the time had come. Absolutely. Let's uh, circle back to the main event tom um i've got a got a question for you is there any way that you think nate diaz gets any respect off hamza chimaev in this fight i certainly don't um <laughs> i just feel like there's no way no way for him to to come out you know with anything from this fight other than the scenario we talked about earlier where you know he somehow gets back to the corner and then they uh they just they call it off because Nate's just like nah you know I would love mm. that um, now I've been struggling a lot here going into this fight because I just I, it doesn't make sense to me I can't justify it I don't like it and traditionally I don't really like Nate Diaz 
Okay. All right. I don't really. Yeah. Uh, I know that might alienate some people out there, but um, I've just never. He's just never really been at the the cut and thrust of the division for me. I. You've always been a guy, I think, who values the rankings in a way. Or the sport, Joe. Of the the sport. sport. The sport. Yeah. You want. You want. You want the guys. Basically, the best. The best. You want the best getting separated from everyone else, and you want them to face each other. And oh, what we have yes. is is Hamzat Shemaev, who is part of the best. He is he's in that category category, I should say, of the world's weight division with Kamaru Usman, Leon Edwards, Colby Covington, Hamzat Shemaev. That is that's your four at welterweight, and I don't think there's any way in any universe, to be honest, that I see Nate Diaz winning a fight against any of those four. Like, realistically, I mean, Colby Covington versus Nate Diaz would be a bloodbath. It would be an embarrassment to the sport, uh, much like this. You know, Nate's personality, I think, is what drives his popularity rather than his fight style. You know, it's the weed smoking, it's the I don't care attitude. You know, he's even said about this fight, he doesn't care if he loses. Which then always takes me back to that classic pro wrestling thing of like, you know, you cut a promo on a guy and you say, this guy's, this guy's shit. And it's like, you beat him and it's like, all you've done is beaten shit. Like, you've not beaten anything of any value. And Nate Diaz is removing any value of this fight. I don't know if that's a middle finger to the UFC. But maybe that's appealing to people who say, I don't care if I lose. Great, he, this guy doesn't care if he loses, I'm going to spend my money to watch him. For me, that turns me off. I don't want to. I don't want to engage. Well, but at the same time, Joe, uh, you know, whereas I've always cherished the the sporting element, as you say, the best meeting the best. Um, we have seen the best fighting the best. We've seen Adesanya uh, just fight Jared Cannonier mm. in at middleweight. Uh, not much of a spectacle. No, won't remember that fight next year. No, uh, don't really want to watch. Israel Adesanya fighting anyone other than uh, his nemesis. Alex Pereira, yeah. Alex Pereira. Um, So, you know, this is where Nate obviously has some ground in that he he is an entertaining fighter. You know, he he has had those those moments. Of course, Conor McGregor. um, You know, he goes out there to put on a show for the fans. Yeah. And how important is that? Putting on a show, yeah, it matters to the UFC. But to it... to you, Joe. Oh, to me. Yeah. Um. I think it depends. Really, I think it depends on the the fighter, in a way, because it's. I think Adesanya is a good barometer because we know how high his ceiling is, and all the fighters know how high his ceiling is. So now they've started to figure out a way to get around that. It means that they don't win the fights, but it also means they don't get knocked out yeah, and humped. And mounted. And humped, yes. <laughs> like Paolo Costa. But, like, he put a warning out there for everybody. You trade with me, son, you're getting mounted. Yeah, you're getting mounted. Uh, and that's after the fight. <laughs> yeah, like, now, yeah, Paolo okay. Costa, for, every, for all the reasons we love him, I also do hate him for that, in a way, because, like, he had to sacrifice himself. It's a warning. Yeah, it yeah, is, it is yeah. a warning. Now, okay, let me let me ask you this, Joe. Uh, Wait, hold on. Let Brian Barberena. Hold on, let me flip okay. that to you. Does it matter to you? Well, this, this is what I'm getting onto now. I mean, okay. Brian Barberena, Robbie Lawler. Not the greatest sporting spectacle. Yeah. But it was a lot of fun. Yeah, sure. But in the same way, and, like... Well, you know, like, I will remember that fight. <laughs> they have Big Macs are fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Now, no, of course I want to see the best fighting the best. Um, but yes, entertainment does matter, okay? Like, I love Joaquin Buckley. I think that's become clear. He just lost his fight. You know, that doesn't mean I love him any less. Yeah. So I think there is credence to be given to Diaz in that he's ready to go and fight guys he can't beat. Like, yeah. like he's ready to take that risk. Yeah, but you know? he's on, not you've just, like you've just referenced Brian Barberena and Robbie Lawler. That's a prelim fight. I want my prelim fights to be fun, or I want them to be revealing. Hopefully, it can be both. Yeah, yeah. my title fights. It's 
I want the bleeding edge of the sport to clash. I don't think that's, you know, unfair. No, that's that's no, and that's not that's not happening this weekend at no. all. No. I guess this this kind of discussion is all part of this um yeah, it's just me trying to reconcile this love for Diaz and trying to see like maybe should I credit him more? Is he a man who could be in the Hall of Fame? Because he's had the moments, because he's been an entertainer, because he's been ready to fight anyone. Yeah. He's not been like protected, you know? He's not taken steroids. No. Right? He's fought a Every guy he's fighting, or come on, let's be honest, the majority of guys he's fighting are juicing. They've got an unfair advantage, and they've all got polished records. They're avoiding bad matchups. Mm. You know, they're taking the most sensible path in the fight. They're laying and praying, you mm. know, when necessary. Diaz, he's never done these things. He's he's had longevity. He's lived through different eras in the sport, and you know, and he's ultimately built a brand. He's been incredibly successful. I mean. He's someone that a lot of a lot of guys they would want to emulate, but nobody's really taking that path, you know. Everybody's picking the easy options. I guess in in looking at this, I I I guess I'm talking myself into a position where maybe I haven't respected Diaz enough. Is that wrong? Maybe, but then also, shouldn't your taste be respected? Like me saying, and I'm similar to you, of like I like Diaz, I like him in certain scenarios. Conor McGregor is ideal. They're perfect for each other. You know, they work really well. Nate Diaz versus Jorge Masvidal, not so much. Nate Diaz versus Hamza Chimaev and Leon Edwards, not so much. You know, it's... I don't need to see that. I don't need to see Nate get beaten up and then him landing a 1-2 and pointing and being like, look, I landed a 1-2 on you. That means I'm the champ, really. And it's like, you know, Nate's got his logic that fan his fans buy into, but it's... I'll say it's tedious. Like, I don't, I don't like this in any sport. It's like you know. But but what about the fact he's ready to fight anybody, Joe? Like, what do you yeah, say I, to that? I like, respect like, it, but like, you know, if that's I mean, the, Colby's that's the... not fighting Hamza. Yeah, but he's he doesn't want to get brain damage. Like, should, but <laughs> should should do you respect Colby more for that or less for that? It's complicated, though, isn't it? Like, isn't it, there's no yes or no answer with that. Do you, like, do, no, you? Joe, do you respect Colby more? Well, I'll tell you who I do respect a huge amount. That's Jose Aldo. Yeah. All right? He just went and fought Marab Tavashvili, mm. who's been, like, running through people with a high-intensity pressure wrestling style that was always going to be tough for Aldo. Mm. It was always going to, you know, a guy who fights kind of slowly, a bit methodically, he picks his shots, he's, he kind of, you know... He waits. He, he doesn't... He, he does, yeah. He waits. And then he's only fighting three rounds. He was always going to have uh, Yuma and Marab just... Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he took the fight, Joe. Mm. He he took the fight. It was an unnecessary fight for him to take, but he was ready to take okay, it. that's fine. Aldo taking that fight is fine. Aldo always taking that fight is not fine. Like, sometimes you have to take that fight, and I respect him for doing it. But if you go out of your way to take those fights all the time, then at a certain point, I think you're a bit of a rube. Um, I know that Nate wants out of his UFC contract desperately so he can go make a fool of himself boxing Jake Paul, you know, and if he wants to go do that, that's fine and make a load of money, good for them. But to me, that's not sport. This isn't sport, this main event. This is not sport of, at all. This is promotion. This is making a buck off of a guy's name on the way out. I don't yeah, think we're... it's going to translate to more Hamzat fans. No, no, that's another interesting question. I mean, we're united in that this fight should not be happening. Um, yeah. I guess it's more like, you know, rather than just dismissing Diaz entirely, I feel like there is actually some value in, in what he has to say, you know, mm. i.e., like, I haven't taken steroids. I've been there through many generations. I, I The names on my record, all right, I've lost to them, but I stood in there. I was ready to fight them, even not in the best terms for myself. Um, and I feel like, yeah, we 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 want we we don't want more Nate Diaz's, okay, but we want more fighters. You know, we don't just want people who like we don't want it to turn into boxing where you you avoid bad matchups of and course. you need a perfect record and you but, crush cans to get there. Yeah, no, I get that. That's fine. Um, yeah, I just 
Nate Diaz is this weird barometer, though, isn't he? Of, like, the pulse of the fan base and of what certain people think of the sport. If I ask someone and they and I say, and I find out they're into MMA and I say, who do you, who's your favourite fighter of all time? And they said Nate Diaz. I'd roll my eyes a little bit. Like, you know, I'm not asking for, like, a hipster's choice. Do you know what I mean? If you're dropping Caro Parisian, I'll be like, okay, right, that's a bit obscure. Fair play, but, like... You know, I, I love I love judo trips as much as the next man, but like this is like, it's like okay, I get it. You're a casual fan. You love the action fight. You love the, no, it's true though, and there's nothing wrong with being a casual fan. But like, you know, you want the action fighter who says funny things. That's what you want, and that's fine. I ain't surprised, motherfuckers. Uh, yeah, I ain't, and I ain't surprised that you don't know much about the sport. Like that, that would be yeah. that would be my take on it. I mean. The cult of Diaz, I find it tiring. I find it tiring. Of course. Uh, of course. Um, and, you know, and me too. I guess that's why I'm trying to understand it better. And I'm saying, is there anything behind it? And I guess what I'm discovering is that, yeah, there is. Like, there is a lot to, to love there. Of course. Not in what he is necessarily, but in some of the things that he represents. Like, like this whole thing they make in the UFC about, you know, he's always ready for a scrap, you know. He'll yeah. fight anyone, anytime, any place. Uh most of the guys, they're not about that life, and I don't think they should be. They're professional sportsmen. But uh, it isn't boxing. It is, you know, it does have that entertainment aspect. It is about, it doesn't matter if you lose some fights. Mm. It doesn't matter. It doesn't make, Jose Alzo isn't worse. His legacy isn't diminished because he got beat He's by one of the all-time Marab. Greats. He's one of the all-time greats. He's one of the all-time greats. He's still right there at the top of the rankings. He doesn't even need to go down necessarily yeah. because it was a, Raise a close fight. That's fine, you know? though, because it's Jose Aldo. This is Nate Diaz we're talking about. A very limited fighter who we've seen his flaws for a Joe, decade. A hundred percent. I'm just saying he, he represents some things that I think we want to stay in the sport. Of course. We, we don't want Nate, necessarily, to stay in the sport. But, yeah, but some of that character should remain. Do we? Like... No. Getting lost for three years, you know, going away for three years, taking your toys home. No, 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 fight, sure. Like... There's lots to criticize. Yeah, yeah. No, no, Nate himself, yeah, it's okay. Go fight Jake Paul. That's good. That's great. Fair enough. Don't lose. Don't lose to Jake Paul. Yeah, please. Jesus. Anderson. Stop. Anderson Silver, yeah. please don't Anderson, lose. Anderson, to... please. Please, God. Please. For the love of if, God. If Jake, oh, God, Joe, no. no. Right, Tom, let's go through our predictions one more time for the uh, main card of UFC 279. We're going to go from the bottom up now. Uh, Johnny Walker versus Ion Kutalaba. We've both gone for Johnny Walker by knockout. Uh, Irene Aldana versus uh, Macy Chiasson. We've both gone for Aldana by decision. Kevin Holland versus Daniel Rodriguez. Both gone for a Holland decision. Li Jing Liang. I've gone for a knockout for the leech and you have gone for a Tony Ferguson decision. That's just that blows my mind. And then in the main event, we've both gone for a Hamzat Shemaev knockout victory over Nate Diaz. A fight that I feel like as soon as I've watched it, I'll really want to have forget about it. Uh, Unfortunately, Joe, that likely applies to this whole card. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's very underwhelming, and it's I not, not. It's a terrible play. card. It's, it's, a it's a terrible card. It's, you know, fight night material. Let's and it's be, mad that they... Evil. And they charge $75 in America for this. Yeah, I'm, I'm that not... Is, I'm that not is really, ludicrous. Yeah. That is ludicrous. Anyway, listeners, thank you so much for joining us. Rate, review, all that on iTunes and stuff, if you want. Spotify as well. We, we, we want it, guys. We, we, yeah, we, we want we it, please. Help. Please, please, help please, us. please, uh, please, 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 please. <laughs> You can contact us at holdonbrother69 at gmail.com. And, uh, yeah, thank you so much for listening. Tom, thank you so much for joining me. And, uh, listeners, we'll be back next week to break down whatever the hell this was and uh, hopefully glean something from it. Uh, Tom, speak to you next week. Yep, thanks, Joe.